be seated. Well, if I'm honest, I was having a bit of a moment over there this morning just thinking about uh, that song that we sang, A Thousand Hallelujahs, and just the overwhelming sense of gratitude for God's faithfulness to us as a congregation. Um, then to have Kathy come and share that incredible news about our mortgage being paid off and thinking about the exceptional leadership that our finance committee has given in figuring out how to best structure uh, that kind of debt and how best to pay it off. And what's most, you know, one of the things that stands out to me as we think about that is not to the expense of other ministries. So as to say, if there was ministry we wanted to do, we weren't saying, no, we can't do that, we can't do that. We've been through a season of great growth of our ministries, adding staff and helping new families come to Canada and being a blessing in our neighborhood in so many other ways as we also look to pay down our mortgage as we did. And an incredible leadership given by our finance committee. And then to have Steve come up and give that prayer. Um, some of you would be too new to know this, um, but Stephen used to be the senior pastor here. And uh, this was part of his vision, this facility and this relocation so that we could continue to reach people here in the city of St. John. And the amazing thing is, you know, we did a survey a few years ago and that over half of you weren't here then, which is great in the sense that that's why we relocated. That's why this place exists. It's why we exist as a church family, not so that we could have been more comfortable and had better parking and uh, nicer office space or anything like that, uh, but so that we could continue as a congregation uh, to be a blessing to our city. So uh, just having a moment. Uh, thank you to Tim for moving me around here this morning. Um, we're continuing in our series on Ephesians. We're going to be looking at chapter 4 today. If you have your Bible, I'd encourage you to get it out. Um, a real great welcome to those of you who are joining us online as well this morning. You know, I'll say this hopefully for the next few weeks as we continue to return uh, to in-person services. You know, if you're thinking about returning, there's a spot for you here. We would love to have you join us uh, when you're ready. So we, we look forward to that. For those of you who are going to be online for a bit, we hope that you'll continue to be faithful, stay connected, and find some ways um, to be connected beyond just online, whether it's reaching out through people, participating in some of the ministries that Pastor John shared with us here this morning. We would love to stay connected as we continue to return uh, in this season. So let me ask you a question as we get started today. Um, has anybody ever told you to grow up? If, you're not, if English isn't your first language, we have this phrase, grow up, uh, which doesn't mean get taller or uh, learn how to grow a beard, but uh, it means to mature. Has anybody ever told you this? I know it's early. It's only like, I don't know, 11.30, so the day is yet young. Maybe it was a teacher you were goofing off in class or acting less than your age, and they kindly said, grow up. Maybe it was a parent or a sibling. You were doing something at the dinner table. You were telling a story or acting a little bit childish or foolish. And there's an idea, if you're this kind of age, that your behavior should match your age. And you were acting a little bit down here. And so they said to you, would you just grow up? Maybe it was a spouse a significant other in your life who just heard you say something or do something and they just thought, oh, grow up. Anybody? It's just me. We have this phrase because um, there's sometimes as you get older in age, there's an expectation that your behavior will change, that you will mature, and that you will change and grow and adapt and ways that you used to do things, will you'll leave them behind and you'll do other things. Um, ways that you used to see the world will mature, and you'll see the world as it really is, and so you'll adapt your behaviors. There's a sense that all of us, as we get older, there's a maturation process that will change, which means our behaviors will follow suit. This is the theme of chapter 4 that we're looking at today in the letter that Paul wrote to the people in Ephesians. If I could sum it up, it would be Paul saying kindly, not disparagingly, grow up. Grow up in your faith. Grow up into Christ. Grow up into the body of believers that God has called you to be. And there's a couple of marks that kind of define that maturity for Paul that we'll look at today. Um, but there's so much stuff in this chapter, and I apologize in advance um, that we're not going to be able to talk about all of it, and you'll be glad for that because there's a football game or something on tonight at some point that I know some of you would really like to, uh, to get to. But I'm praying, just as I was praying through this text this week and this morning, 
that maybe there's something in this passage related to your own spiritual maturity that the Lord wants to deal with, and you'd be open to that today, regardless of whether or not it's one of the main things we talk about at all or not. So again, I want you to picture a local church in the city of Ephesus. The Apostle Paul had visited there. He has now left. It's about eight to ten years later. He hears about some of the challenges that they're having. He writes them this letter. And I don't want you to think, you know, maybe your idea of what a church would be in that day. Let me kind of capture for you a little bit some of the differences. So I want you to picture an outdoor courtyard. It's Sunday morning. People are gathering for worship in the Roman city of Ephesus. This little band of believers are gathering together for church. And I want to just kind of give you four examples of what that community may have looked like by kind of illustrating it through four people. The first person is a slave. He had been born in Egypt. He would grew up worshiping Egyptian gods. And when he grew up hearing about the stories of the Israelites leaving Egypt, um, he remembered the, Is- or the Egyptians being the victims, not the victors. He had a lot of anger. He's been owned and sold and owned and sold a few times. He's got this thing about uh, slave owners. He's got this thing about wealthy people where there's a lot of anger associated with that. He's become a Christian, and now he's attending this little church in Ephesus. Person number one. Second person is a a poor young lady. She had been born with a birth defect. Her her arm was disfigured when she was born. And as was the custom of of her day in the Roman world, um, they gave her up to the practice of exposure. Uh, Common in the ancient world was if you had a child that had a birth defect, or maybe it was a girl and you really wanted a boy, you would take that child out to a hillside and you would leave it there, exposed to the elements and exposed to the animals for it to die. This was common practice. Also common practice in this day was Christians who believed that all life was sacred would go out to these hillsides and they would rescue some of these children. And this young girl has been rescued by this Christian family. They've brought her into her home. They treat her like one of their own kids. She's healthy. She's learned to read. And she is part of this church in Ephesus. Person number three, sitting in this courtyard waiting for the service to begin, is a wealthy businesswoman uh, from a Roman family. She'd been a leader in the temple of Artemis. She'd been involved in idol worship. She participated in the sexual practices that were part of that temple experience. Uh, She's become a Christian. And now she's part of this church in Ephesus. If you were to go to her home, you would see that she still has some of those idols on the shelf. And on family occasions, when the whole family is going back to the old temple for family events, she joins in. Person number four, a Jewish man a tradesperson, a laborer. He'd become a Christian and is now attending the church in Ephesus. He grew up with the Ten Commandments and the view that Moses is the most authoritative voice on every issue, that real people, real people of faith, they worship on Saturday and not on Sunday. And he wished all the church lucks. Why can they not be kosher? This is person number four. And they're all sitting around together as part of the same church common faith in Christ, common calling on their lives. And Paul is writing to people like this saying, grow up. I want you to grow up into your faith and to grow up into Christ. And he points out four different marks. Uh, The first mark we will call um, the maturity, the mark of maturity is unity. Let me read for you verses one to six from Ephesians chapter four. This is Paul saying, As a prisoner for the Lord, remember he's writing this from jail, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. He's not entering into this passage lightly. He's laying it on heavy. You've been called for something. Be completely humble, gentle, patient, bearing with one another in love. These words in and of themselves, we could spend the next three hours talking about. Make every effort to keep unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. And here he goes. All of you with all your diverse attitudes and perspectives on everything, there's one body. There's one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God and Father of all who is over all, 
through all, and in all. Paul is trying to call these believers to grow up and to mature in their faith. He knows God loves them, that God welcomed them into his family as they were broken and sinful people, but he does not intend to leave them there. And so the challenge for Paul is, I need these people to see the potential for what God wants to do in their lives. And the challenge for them, the challenge for us today, is that we all want to hold on to our old ways a little bit. Old ways of living, old ways of speaking, old ways of seeing our spouses, old ways of thinking. And Paul is trying to challenge these believers in me today, and hopefully you as well that God is going to unite us together and do something new as we surrender ourselves to him. He says here, one baptism. Baptism is the act where we symbolically uh, share the story that we have died to ourselves and that we've been raised new life in Christ, that we've given up our old ways and that we're letting Christ be now Lord of our lives. It's that mark in our life where we say no more. I'm a child of God. I'm going to start living like a child of God. And Paul uses this imagery here of baptism and reminding us again that all of us together here this morning, if you are chosen to be a Christian, that's true of you. There was a moment in all of our lives where we surrendered. And Paul says, if we're going to be united as a church, we start by remembering that moment where we stood at the foot of the cross and we gave our lives to him. Now, as God begins reworking us in our lives, that act of spiritual formation, though that lifestyle of discipleship where we continue to grow and wrestle with faith and what does it look like to live it out, God begins to retool and repurpose and refashion and reform our lives. And we suddenly discover it applies to every aspect of our life. How we speak, how we work, how we treat the people that we work for, the people that we're married to, all of it. So Paul says to all of these believers who are so different, one of the marks of our life, the sign that we're a mature people is that we are growing in our capacity to be united together. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. The second mark, verses, starting at verse 7, and then we'll jump from 11 to 16, is the mark of building each other up. Building each other up. Let me read uh, verse 7 and then 11 to 16 for us. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers to equip his people for the works of service. And this is it. So the body of Christ might be built up so that it would mature until we reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son and God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. It's hard to even get our minds around what that really means. Therefore, then, we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head or the source that is Christ. From him, the whole body is joined and held together by every supporting ligament. It grows and it builds itself up in love as each, part, each one does its part. Did you know that you're God's gift to this church? Turn to the person next to you and say, I'm God's gift to this church. Go ahead. And then you can say back to them, grow up. The image that Paul uses here is a physical body, made up of di different parts, each of them equal, each of them unique, contributing in different ways. And if you are a Christian today, God has given each and every one of you a gift, no exceptions. I don't care how old you are. I don't care about your employment status. I don't care if you're at home watching online and aren't able to leave your house, aren't able to drive. Um, God has a given each of you a gift, and our church is stronger. The body of this church is more mature when you use those. And the gift isn't for you. And these are the best kind of gifts, the kind that you get to give away because they multiply the blessings. And the purpose of your gift is to help someone here, someone online today, 
mature and grow in their faith. That is the purpose of the gift that you have been given. You've been given something unique that I need, that I need in order for me to grow up in my faith. You need to use the gift that God has given to you. We saw it this morning as the worship team sang, they use their gifts. I don't know about you, I was built up, I was encouraged by them using their gifts. Do you know what gift God has given to you? Have you found a place to use it? I know some of you would say, look, in these last two years, there were things I used to love to do, and we've not been able to do them, or we've moved them online, and I've, there's not been opportunity. I, I understand that. It's important in this season for each of us to think, God, what is the gift that you've given to me, and how can I use it? How can I get back to using it? One of the things of my gifts is found in this passage and the other pastors here, because Paul speaks directly to the role of pastors and leaders. And I just want to point this out. Our job is not to perform for you so that you might be entertained. Our job is to help you figure out what your gift is and where it is that you can use it so that the whole body of Christ can be strengthened. It's to help to remind you that you are a masterpiece. Remember, you're a masterpiece created and God has given and planned in advance. There'd be things that you would do, only you. Because you've got a unique gift that our church family needs. And in this season of coming back to services and figuring out what ministry looks like again, let me invite you, encourage you, challenge you to say, what is my gift? And where is it that I can be using it? Because right now, we need to be built up, don't we? This has been a difficult season. There's people that need to be encouraged, need to be helped to grow in their faith. Mark number two of a church that's mature. We know what our gift is, and we're using it to help build someone else up. Mark number three. You don't go back to Egypt. That's what I'm calling this point. I don't know about you, when I read Ephesians chapter 4, it's one of my favorite passages of Scripture. It's deeply informed my own personal understanding and role as a pastor. But when I read these first 16 verses, I get pumped up. Um, I think about the church where at its core, you've got diversity, and yet people have surrendered their lives to Christ. They're baptized together. They don't want their will anymore. They want the Lord's will, and they're working together in their uniqueness and in their differentness to see the body come alive and to give witness to the city around us about the goodness of God and what happens in our hearts when we surrender our lives to him. It's beautiful to me. But can you picture a scenario where it might fall apart? Can you picture a scenario where our behaviors or our old habits might hurt, injure, maim, tarnish, or completely ruin the witness of our congregation? (laughs) Can you picture a scenario? One of the great salvation stories of Scripture is the story of God rescuing the people of Israel from the land of Egypt, where they've been slaves for 400 years. They'd been mistreated, they were being killed, and they cry out to God, and God rescues them. He sends them Moses. And through a dramatic series of events, he leads the people out of Israel. They cross the Red Sea. They're now a free people journeying towards the promised land where they're going to be a nation. They're going to finally have their own land. This is what they'd wanted all along. What could be better? If you've read the story of the people leaving the land, you'll remember it was not very long into their freedom when what? They wanted to go back to Egypt. They wanted to go back to their oppressors. They cursed Moses for leading them out and said, why did you bring us out here to die? If only we could go back to Egypt. Egypt was familiar. They knew what was expected of them. They knew what life would be like. They knew their daily routines. It was comfortable to them. Paul is saying in these verses, maturing in Christ is hard. Learning to put on Christ and throw off our old ways is hard. And there might be moments when we are tempted to go back. Go back to Egypt. Go back to the old ways that we used to live. Old ways of treating our spouse. Old ways of handling our money. Old ways of speaking with people that we disagree with. And just go back. And Paul, in these next verses I'm going to read for you, points out four ways that this church in particular was tempted to go back. Let me read them for you quickly. Starting at verse 25 to verse 32. 
Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood or lying and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not, that less, do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their own hands, that they may have something to share with those in need. Do not let, un- let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that they may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling. Seriously? You know it's there because it happened. Brawling and slander among every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. So I'm going to go through these because they're here. And I suspect that just as they were issues in the early church, maybe there's some things here that we need to be reminded of today. Paul says there's four things that could, where we might be tempted to go back to Egypt that might undo our unity and might undo our purpose and might undo our witness. The first is lying. Lying's really common. It's something that we don't think about a lot. It's something we've just kind of adopted and gotten used to as being a part. We are always trying to sift out what's the real meaning of this, what's really going on here, because there's so much dishonesty or lack of truth-telling in our day. If you do not believe me, this week, pen and paper, something on your phone, and just keep track of how often you are tempted to not tell the full truth, to round up or to round down, or to spread a rumor that is untruthful in some way. Paul uses a language here that as Christians, we are supposed to be people who love the truth. In fact, he uses the phrase here, speaking the truth in love. I was reminded of this week, I read this wonderful story uh, about a basketball coach named Greg Popovich, who coached the San Antonio Spurs. Um, He was not a traditional coach, and no one really looked at him and thought, this guy's going to be a great coach basketball coach, but he turned out to be. And the thing was, unlike other coaches, he got the job done in ways that other people didn't. And as people started to analyze, what is it about this unconventional coach that's making him so successful and making their team so successful in in the NBA, they found out something unique. And that it was he created an incredible atmosphere of care and trust with his players. That he intentionally spent time building an atmosphere of care and trust with the team that he was coaching. He looked after his teammates. He talked to them about issues that were going on in their personal lives. He spent time with them over many, many meals, bringing them together, talking to them, listening to their life stories. He created a culture of care. Now, that's fine. There's lots of people that do that. But what made him such a good coach was he created such a culture of care that when the moment came for him to sit a player down and tell them that they'd been underperforming, they hadn't been doing it something right, They were open to hearing about it because they already knew they were loved. One player said this, he'll tell you the truth and then he'll love you to death. (laughs) The church ought to be the place where love is just the base standard of operations so that when we try to speak the truth to each other, it will be done in love. The second thing he talks about here is anger. And Paul is referring to what I would call non-righteous anger. And as I just described the four church members that might be part of this congregation in Ephesus, you can imagine how anger could be part of the church. I cannot believe that we're worshiping on Sundays instead of Saturdays. I cannot believe that we're not listening to Moses like we used to. Instead, Jesus has the more dominant voice. I cannot believe that women are in this meeting and on and on and on. And I would say to you that, you know, in modern day church world, sin or anger has become one of those sins that we've just kind of turned a blind eye to. I mean, if someone can, commits a sexual sin, it's like, yikes, you know, code red. If someone blows their top at a meeting and torches somebody with their words and anger, we just kind of say, <laughs> well, that's just Rob. He's just like that. Frederick Buechner writes this of anger. Of all the seven deadly sins, anger is possibly the most fun. 
to lick your wounds, to smack your lips over grievances long past, to roll over your tongue the prospect of bitter confrontation still to come, to savor the last toothsome morsel, both the pain you are given and the pain that you're going to give back. In many ways, it is a feast fit for a king. The chief drawback is that you are wolfing down yourself. The skeleton at the feast is you. Paul says to this church, anger cannot have a home here. We will get angry. That is normal. How we deal with our anger is so important. In fact, he uses some strong language here. He says, when we live a life where we do not deal with our anger, it opens a door for the evil one to have influence in our life. It allows the evil one to have a seat at the table, which impacts all other kinds of ways. And so he says here so bluntly, don't let the sun go down on your anger. In other words, deal with it before the end of the day. Anger. Third, stealing. <laughs> it's tax season. It, I read that $8 billion is stolen each year. 60% <laughs> is stolen from people at work. 60% of $8 billion. Theft is one of those things that we've justified in some ways because everybody does it, because I can steal things digitally and it's easy and no one really knows about it and everybody I steal from is a millionaire anyways, right? So let me just have a little fun with that logic for a second. So let's say you have, are stealing Netflix movies, music, whatever it might be. And, you know, you're justifying it because it's a multi-billion dollar company and all the people that work in those movies, they're all rich anyway, so it doesn't really matter, Right? With that same kind of logic, imagine that you make $80,000 a year, which is about the average household income in St. John. That would mean by that same logic that somebody that makes $20,000 a year, so much, much less than you, is entitled to steal from you. Which means if you go home today from church, or maybe you pop out today to get some groceries after watching this and come back, and you see somebody in your kitchen stealing groceries from your fridge, show them where the good deli meats are and the good stuff because they're entitled to it by that same kind of logic. <laughs> and you can imagine in the context of a church, if there's church members who are stealing from each other, who are known to be dishonest in their business dealings with people in the community, how it would not only pull apart the unity, but undo their witness. Number four, quickly, speech. We won't need to talk a lot about this, but here's what I know. Let's say you walked in the doors here today, or you open up your inbox today, and you have eight emails telling you what a gift you are, how encouraging you are, how much your life has been a blessing to somebody, and one email from somebody telling you that they're not too pleased with you and they don't like you. Which one do you think about all night? <laughs> it's the one. One harsh, hurtful word or phrase can undo weeks, even years of encouragement of other people. St. Augustine had this sign over the table of his house. Anyone who speaks evil against someone not present at this table is not welcome at this table. And I think that applies to our kitchen tables, the tables at restaurants we go to, or in our life groups as well. So here's Paul. These people that are so different in their backgrounds and their upbringing and their journey of the faith, and he can envision that they are maturing in their faith that they're growing up in their faith, that they are becoming more and more the people that God wants them to be, that God is using their lives to, to bring his blessing to the world. And so he's calling them and us and me up. But he also realizes that each of us have the potential within us to so easily undo the work of God. He even uses the language here that we would grieve the Holy Spirit. This is strong emotional language. How many of you have ever removed wallpaper from a, a room in your house? What a joy. The hours of scraping tedious little pieces off, spraying and scraping, and uh, just horrible work if you've ever tried to remove wallpaper from a wall. Imagine for a second God's Spirit is doing that work in us, renovating us, doing the wallpaper, tearing it down bit by bit through years of work only to go to bed at night and wake up and discover that overnight you and I re-wallpapered the entire room and the spirit must start again. This is the image of grieving. And so Paul speaks to these folks, he speaks to us. 
God is inviting us to be mature in our faith. God is inviting us into a lifestyle where God's spirit is transforming us from the inside out, where we're leaving some of these old ways behind, where we're coming united under Jesus as Lord, where we're giving ourselves in service to the people around us. And as we do, the church is growing in its fullness and in its witness, not just to each other, but to our city. So this morning, as we close, I'm going to lead us in a time of prayer. And I'm going to pray for some of the specific things that Paul mentions in these verses uh, for each of us just to be thinking about. And I don't know if there's some areas in here that the Lord would like you to be thinking about or dealing with, but I would encourage you to, to take it, pay attention to that. So I'm in fact going to invite you to stand with me at this time. Stretch your legs a little. And I'm going to lead us in a time of prayer as we get ready to conclude our service. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, this morning, as we envision our own spiritual lives and the call that you've placed on us to, to grow up into maturity, to grow up into him, to embrace uh, this life of faith that you've called us to. Forgive us for wanting it to happen easily and quickly. Forgive us, Lord, for the ways in which we have been dishonest, for the ways that we have shared half-truths, Lord, for not being completely honest with the people that we love. Lord, forgive us for allowing unrighteous anger to have a root in our hearts, for holding on to it and cultivating it and using it as an excuse to hurt others. Lord, forgive us today for taking what is not ours and for any ways that we live that are deceitful. And Lord, forgive us for the ways that we've used our words, whether intentionally or accidentally, to hurt or to discourage someone else. Lord, today we stand at the foot of the cross. We remember that you poured out grace for us so that we could be made new into this people, this community of faith that lives in such a way that reflects the values of Christ, that the world would see you and how we treat each other. May this be true of us as we continue to mature, we pray in Christ's name.